Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Celeste Harrison and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I'm so happy to see all of you today and to welcome you to another amazing Explorer classroom. Here at National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration and of wonder to change our world. These Explorer Classroom events connect students all around the world with our National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and extended Q&As. We're now hosting Explorer Classroom every school day at 2 p.m. Eastern time in addition to our usual events. So if you'd like, I can see you right back here tomorrow for some more Explorer Classroom fun. But for today, we have a very special day because today, June 1st, is Dinosaur Day. And to celebrate Dinosaur Day, we are very lucky to have the amazing Nizar Ibrahim joining us. Nizar is a paleontologist who scours the desert for clues of life from millions of years ago. Today we're going to hear a little bit more about Nizar's most famous find, the Spinosaurus, who we lovingly refer to around Nat Geo as the Spino Dino. <laughs> but before we get to Spino, I want to acknowledge that we are joined on screen by several lovely student groups today and we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds more of you registered to participate along on YouTube. Our students today represent Arizona, California, Connecticut, the District of Columbia, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Illinois, Indiana, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maine, Massachusetts, Maryland, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, Mississippi, North Carolina, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Oklahoma, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Texas, Utah, Virginia, Washington, Wisconsin, Wyoming, Chile, Canada, Japan, Romania, the United Kingdom, India, Mexico, Argentina, and I'm sure many more. So if I happen to miss your location, please let us know in the chat bar. We'd love to give you a shout out and say hi. But for now, that is plenty from me. It's time to turn it over to Nizar for today's Explorer Classroom lesson so we can talk about some dinosaurs. All right, thank you. Thanks so much. And happy Dinosaur Day, best day of the year. So um, we will talk about a really strange enigmatic dinosaur, um, but I'll also tell you a little bit more about um, my work in the Sahara. So let me just start the screen share. All right. Okay. So I am a paleontologist and uh, I get to do something pretty amazing. For me, paleontology is not just about digging up bones um, and excavating skeletons. Uh, paleontology also allows me to do something pretty incredible. Um, I get to travel back in time. I get to be a real lifetime traveler. So uh, paleontologists piece together a pretty incredible story, the greatest story out there, the history of life on Earth. And um, the tiny little slice of time that we call the present really is very small in this big, um, vast story. Um, the part of the story I'm most interested in is um, the portion we call the age of dinosaurs. And the age of dinosaurs was a very, very important uh, part of the history of life on Earth. Uh, many important groups appeared during this time, uh, animals like birds, for example. So it's a, a pretty incredible story. And when it comes to the age of dinosaurs, much of what we know um, is based on discoveries from places like the United States. So let's look at some famous dinosaurs from the United States. This here is T-Rex. We all know T-Rex. Uh, here's another famous dinosaur from the United States. This one is called Stegosaurus. Um, we all know these dinosaurs and we all love them, um, but there's something uh, many people don't really know. And that is that we don't really know much about dinosaurs from some other parts of the world. So if we look at Africa, for example, where I uh, do most of my field work, um, we really don't know all that much about Africa's age of dinosaurs. And so um, a very, very long time ago, a small number of paleontologists started to scour the shifting sands uh, of the Sahara Desert in Africa in search of dinosaurs. And this here is one of them. This is a pioneering German paleontologist called Ernst Stromer. And he collected some pretty incredible African dinosaurs, uh, including a giant predatory dinosaur he named Spinosaurus. This is what 
um, Stromer's reconstruction of Spinosaurus looked like. You can see this is a huge predatory dinosaur, um, a little bit bigger than T-Rex even. And um, it has some really unique features. As you can see, Spinosaurus has a massive sail on its back. Um, some of these big tall spines that form the sail are taller than a person. Um, but we didn't really know all that much about Spinosaurus. So Stromer had a few bones. Um, the dark ones on this image are the bones he described in his uh, scientific work. Um, you can see that Spinosaurus had a strange slender lower jaw. Um, but this reconstruction still kind of looks a little bit like a typical predatory dinosaur, like a T-Rex with a sail, basically, right? Um, big, massive head and a tail, just like all other dinosaurs um, that ends in a very narrow, pointy little bit, narrowing tail. So the dramatic thing that happened to Stromer's Spinosaurus and the other dinosaurs he collected is that they were destroyed in World War II um, in an allied air raid over the museum where they were housed in, in Germany. So all of these um, African dinosaurs that Stromer excavated were destroyed and all these incredible discoveries were reduced to rubble. And so, as I said, we don't know much about African dinosaurs and one of the best collections of African dinosaurs was destroyed in World War II. So that's one of the reasons why I decided to go to Africa. Uh, this is a picture from one of our field sites and I decided to follow in Stroma's footsteps. I wanted to rediscover Spinosaurus and the other enigmatic dinosaurs he unearthed in the sands of the Sahara. I put together a really wonderful international team. These are just some of our team members. Um, you can see some of my Italian colleagues there, colleagues from Morocco. Um, we have a really wonderful team. Um, these guys work under very, very difficult conditions. Sometimes we have to deal with sandstorms and extreme temperatures. And, um, you know, it's, it's a real adventure working in a place like the Sahara. But I have a wonderful team and we excavated uh, a number of incredible fossils. So we dealt with all the challenges, the scorpions, the snakes, um, the sandstorms, even flooding in the Sahara, as you can see on this picture. Um, and we were able to resurrect the ancient world uh, Spinosaurus and these other Saharan dinosaurs lived in. So this is what the Sahara looks like today. Uh, very dry and arid place. It's one of the most inhospitable places on earth. But the fossils we're finding there belong to water-loving creatures uh, in many cases. So the Sahara, very dry today, but a hundred million years ago, it was home to creatures like this one here. This is a car-sized coelacan. Um, turns out that the Sahara was home to huge, absolutely enormous fishes in all shapes and sizes. Um, so it was a river system. Uh, hard to believe, but it was a massive river system. And you can see another one of these aquatic animals uh, we unearthed there. This is a giant uh, sawfish on the ground. Uh, in the background, you could see some plant eating dinosaurs. Um, but one of the other really interesting things we found was that most of the animals we were finding are actually predators. Lots of predatory dinosaurs. You can see two of them here. Here's another one. This is a giant T-Rex sized predatory dinosaur called Cacarodontosaurus. Um, and it turns out that this place was home to several giant predators, dinosaurs, flying reptiles, crocodiles. It was a very, very dangerous place. You wouldn't last very long if you were to visit this place. Um, a human time traveler wouldn't survive for very long. Here's one of the giant flying reptiles we uncovered. Uh, and of course, uh, you're probably wondering, well, what about Spinosaurus, uh, our mysterious dinosaur? We found new remains of Spinosaurus and we started piecing together the appearance of this strange dinosaur. So we now know that this dinosaur had um, a very narrow snout, a uh, head a little bit like a crocodile. So it didn't really have the big massive head you saw in the earlier reconstruction. Um, we also found out that it had um, relatively short hind limbs and some adaptations that suggested that it spent a lot of time in the water. 
Um, so this was a reconstruction we put together back in 2014. Um, you can see the tail is still um, basically looks like the tail of any other dinosaur ends in the tip. It narrows as you go further back on the tail, um, but certainly looks very different from this early reconstruction. But some people were not convinced and some people said, well, yes, it has jaws like a crocodile, but maybe it was not really an aquatic dinosaur, which is what we suggested, that it was a water dwelling dinosaur. So to figure this, this out, we returned to the dig site where we unearthed the Spinosaurus bones. And over the last couple of years, we found many, many more bones of Spinosaurus. And these bones just blew our mind. Um, we found lots of bones. You can see two here. These are actually tail bones of Spinosaurus. Uh, but we didn't just find a couple of bones, you know, we didn't find three, four, five bones. We found countless bones. It was just crazy. We were just finding bone after bone after bone. And most of the bones we found were tail bones. This here is one of the big, massive tail bones near the base of the tail. And when we pieced them together, we saw something absolutely amazing. This is the tail of Spinosaurus. It's about 80% complete. And the tail of Spinosaurus is utterly unique. See these long spines on the tail bones? So this tail doesn't just end in a narrow, very slender bit at the end. It has really long spines. Um, and what this means is that this tail basically looked like a giant fin or a paddle, something we haven't seen in any other dinosaur. You can see a, a reconstruction of the tail here, absolutely bizarre. Um, even the tails near the tip of, uh, even the tail bones near the tip of the tail have these really, really long spines. Um, you can see Spinosaurus with a diver for scale here. Um, and when you look at this animal, you realize, wow, this was, a water dwelling dinosaur. It has jaws like a crocodile, teeth like a crocodile. It has short hind limbs, clearly didn't spend a lot of time on land. And now we also know it had a paddle like tail. So this really rewrites the history of dinosaurs because we used to think that dinosaurs never really invaded the watery world. Now we know they did. So we have a strange predator with crocodile like jaws, conical teeth, and a paddle-like tail. This is like an extraterrestrial from outer space. There's no dinosaur like it out there. And so it really changes our understanding of dinosaurs in, in significant ways. Spinosaurus was not just a generic predatory dinosaur with a sail stuck on its back. It was a river monster going after giant fish in this river system that existed in the Sahara 100 million years ago. So this is, of course, not the last we will hear about Spinosaurus. Um, I'm keeping the presentation short. There are a number of other things we found that we're going to reveal over the next couple of months, or couple of years, I should say. Um, we have other parts of the skeleton of Spinosaurus, um, but we also found a number of other things, uh, remains of other creatures that lived alongside Spinosaurus. Um, and all I can say is that these other discoveries which will be published at some point this year, um, are also um, going to be absolutely amazing. Um, I can't wait to share them with you. That's all I'm gonna say for now, but stay tuned for some more really, really exciting discoveries from the Sahara. Now, before we do the q and I just want to uh, give a shout out to, to my colleagues um, and uh, institutions and universities that uh, supported my work. So, uh, and, and a really big shout out to Davide Bonadonna, who created all the amazing artwork you saw in today's presentation. Um, he is the Michelangelo of dinosaur illustrations. He's extremely talented. Um, so, all right, I'll stop there and I'll get ready for your questions. Well, Nizar, thank you so much. That was absolutely amazing. I think I could listen to you talk about Spinosaurus for like three and a half more hours, but we don't have that kind of time. So we'll move on to questions instead. For folks who are learning along with us at home, we'd love to hear about your favorite part and what you do to follow up after this event. So maybe you pick an activity from the family guide, you draw a picture or write a story. Maybe you do your own miniature excavation in your backyard, whatever it may be, we would love to see it. 
So please send that to us on Twitter. You can tag at NatGeoEducation and use hashtag Explore Classroom. And that will make sure that Nizar gets the chance to see all of your amazing work. And now for questions, if you're watching along on YouTube, please send us your questions in the chat bar. We record everything that gets sent in, so please only send your question one time. If you spam us, we'll, we'll have to put you in timeout and that, that's no fun. Um, we can't wait to hear more great questions from that YouTube chat bar. If you're up on screen with me, get ready with a nice loud voice. I will let you know when it is your turn. Our first question today comes to us from Benjamin Rudolph, who is wondering, Nizar, um, what dinosaur is still alive today? We had a lot of folks in the chat bar jump in and, and talk about birds, but could you maybe explain that a little more for us? Well, birds is a really good answer because uh, birds are dinosaurs. Uh, you know, pigeon, a chicken, an eagle, these are all dinosaurs. We now know that dinosaurs, if you like, invented feathers. Um, so feathers first appeared in uh, small predatory dinosaurs. And even some of the bigger ones uh, may have had some feathery like covering. Um, and so birds evolved from predatory dinosaurs and you can't really draw a line. Basically birds are dinosaurs. Um, uh, there are some other animals alive today that are um, related to dinosaurs. Um, that includes uh, animals like crocodiles, for example. Um, but of course, when, when people think of dinosaurs, they typically think of animals like Triceratops and Stegosaurus and T-Rex. And, and unfortunately, those kinds of dinosaurs are gone. Um, but, uh, you know, we still have birds as a living descendants and birds are very successful, still very diverse. There are more species of birds than there are species of mammals, fun fact. So dinosaurs still rule basically is what I'm saying. Love that, dinosaurs rule. That can be our quote from the day. It's dinosaur um, day, you know? Yeah, exactly. We've got a duel who is wondering, he's got a little challenge for you. Are you able to name 10 different dinosaurs in 10 seconds for us, Nizar? Okay, Cacarodontosaurus, Deltadromeus, Tyrannosaurus, Triceratops, Pentaceratops, uh, Majungasaurus, um, uh, Kentrosaurus, Giraffa Titan, uh, Mamenchisaurus, and Protoceratops. Love that. I hope everyone just got 10 new favorite dinosaurs like I did. And we've got Santino who's wondering how strong dinosaur phones are. Uh, depends. Um, some dinosaurs had fairly fragile bones. Um, Others had, uh, you know, really massive bones like uh, ankylosaurs, for example, are armored dinosaurs that basically look like a tank. And uh, ankylosaurs have massive tail clubs, for example, that they probably use to smash the legs of predatory dinosaurs like T-Rex. So those are really massive bones, right? Um, other dinosaurs were very fast runners. They're very bird-like. So they had, you know, very hollow bones with very thin bone walls. So it really depends. Um, and when you're looking at dinosaur fossils, some of them are really well preserved and others are very fragile and friable. So you have to kind of soak them in glue and, um, you know, wrap them in, in plaster to make sure that they don't crumble to pieces, right? So it really depends. Amazing. Well, let's take our next question from an on-screen student. Let's go to Gangyul. Would you ask a question for us? Um, yeah. Um, are you hoping to find any other fossils of prehistoric creatures in the future? If so, what prehistoric creature? Oh, <laughs> it's a long list. There are many, many different kinds of prehistoric creatures I would like to unearth. We found uh, many different kinds of, of, of fossil animals. We found snakes um, and turtles and flying reptiles and dinosaurs and crocs. Um, and, uh, you know, so we really have a, an entire prehistoric zoo, um, you know, we're piecing together. Um, right now we're working on fossils of Spinosaurus, of course, um, flying reptiles. Um, we're hoping to find some bones of a giant plant eating dinosaur. Um, we found some bits and pieces, but I'd love to find the rest of the skeleton. And we're talking about a really massive animal, an animal that weighed as much as an entire herd of elephants. So really massive animals. So it's going to be a really big job getting those bones out of the ground, but um, when we do find them. But anyway, so lots of projects, yeah. Amazing. Well, we've got the Lava King, uh, probably not your given name, probably your screen name, but the Lava King is wondering what your very favorite dinosaur is, Nizar. Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, because there's so many cool dinosaurs out there. 
And I guess the way I would answer this is usually my favorite dinosaur is the one that I just happen to be working on. So when you're working on Spinosaurus and you find out it had a paddle-like tail, it just you know, blows your mind and then that's your favorite dinosaur. Uh, but then you, know, you move on to another project and you, know, you work on a really cool um, uh, you know, other type of dinosaur, or pterosaur, and then that's kind of your favorite for a few months. So, you know. But of course, yes, Spinosaurus has a special place in my heart. Amazing. We've got Samantha Wexler in the chat bar and Jessica, her six-year-old, who are wondering what are some of the other jobs besides paleontologists who get to work with dinosaur bones? So who else is helping you out in your work, Nizar? That's a really good question. Um, so I mentioned that I work with people from all around the world, but I should also add that I work with people from many different kinds of backgrounds. So I mentioned David Bonadonna, who is a, an artist, right? So he creates this amazing art, bringing these dinosaurs back to life, essentially. I also work with an animator who uh, you know, puts together um, uh, animations where we can look at how dinosaurs move. Uh, I also work with museum and exhibit specialists putting together dinosaur exhibits, right? Um, so there are really many different ways to, to get involved. And not everybody has to be a, a professional paleontologist to, to work on dinosaurs, you know? They're, um, volunteers working in museums and preparing dinosaur bones, removing rock from the bones. And um, so there are really many, many different um, uh, pathways, if you like, um, to, to get involved in, in dinosaur paleontology. So cool. Well, let's take our next question from Alex, who's up on screen with us. Alex, go ahead and ask. Um, if you could be any dinosaur, what dinosaur would you be? Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I would probably not want to be a small plant-eating dinosaur that gets eaten up, right? So I probably would like to be one of the really um, big predatory dinosaurs. I think that would be a, an interesting experience. Spinosaurus, I think, would be really cool because you get to swim um, through this amazing river system. So that would probably be the one I would pick, being a Spinosaurus and having a giant sail on your back. It must be pretty cool. It does sound really pretty cool. And we've got Shay and Pavan who are both wondering how many pounds do you think the Spinosaurus weighed when it was alive? And how much do its bones weigh now? Um, the thing of weighing their bones is a little difficult because we haven't weighed all of the bones and also we're still preparing the bones. So there's still rock attached to the bones. Um, but when the animal was alive, it probably weighed um, between five and seven tons. Uh, but it's actually really difficult to estimate the weight of extinct animals because all you have are the bones. So you have to estimate the size of, you know, the lungs and the heart and the weight of the muscles and, you know, um, and, and that's pretty challenging. So even dinosaurs that we know really well, like T-Rex, um, you know, we, we still change our estimates for the weight of T-Rex. For a long time, we, we assumed that T-Rex weighed about six or seven tons. And now we've kind of have some, some estimates of up to 10 tons, you know, which is a lot more. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a little tricky, but probably something uh, between five and seven tons. Awesome. And we've got Katya up on screen with us who has a question. Go for it, Katya. So you said that b birds are dinosaurs, right? Yes. And uh, I heard that dinosaurs are reptiles. Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, what are dinosaurs, birds or reptiles? Well, see, we have these labels that we use and many of these um, you know, classification labels were introduced a long, long time ago. And so people said, well, all the scaly animals, they are the reptiles and then the feathery ones are the birds. But now, of course, we find animals that are bridging the gap between reptiles and birds. And so uh, strictly speaking, birds, the group birds is kind of nested within the reptiles, right? Um, so when we look at the big tree of life, we realize that many of these categories are just kind of useful labels. And so reptiles is not really um, a terribly accurate term uh, in the sense that most people use it. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's why I said birds are dinosaurs. And so birds are actually nested within the reptiles. 
Awesome. Spencer online has a really interesting question. Spencer is wondering where you take the bones to study them and then where do they go from there? Do you keep bones that you find or do you return them to the countries that you found them in? Uh, I keep all the bones I find in, in my basement. No, I'm not. It's, um, I, I bring them, we bring them to a, a, a paleontological collection in Casablanca in, in Morocco. Uh, at least that's what we do with the Moroccan fossils we find. Um, and so they stay in the country of origin. Sometimes I borrow some of the bones and I'll take them to the United States or, you know, or we bring them over to Europe for scientific study. So, um, but then they ultimately they return to the country of origin. So sometimes when I'm, you know, taking a plane, I will have a, a bunch of dinosaur bones in my backpack, which is always a lot of fun when you're going through customs. I'm like, what is this giant claw? And then you get to explain what the giant claw is. Um, so yeah, so you, you know, we, we move them around, but ultimately they go back to a scientific collection, uh, which is really where they belong. So cool. And we've got a similar question, but a very different angle that I'd love to hear you speak about. We've got Pavan who's wondering how much dinosaur bones can sell for. Is there a way that you determine value and, and can you even buy a dinosaur bone? Um, I don't think you can really put a price tag on a dinosaur. So Spinosaurus, for example, the skeleton we have is the only Spinosaurus skeleton in existence in the world. The only one of its kind. Uh, the only other associated remains, um, you know, were destroyed in World War II, as, as I mentioned earlier on. So, so it's probably very valuable, but, you know, it's, it's you know, these are, um, this is part of our ancient heritage and it's really difficult to put a price tag on that. Um, having said that, some dinosaur skeletons have sold at auctions, right? So there's a famous T-Rex skeleton that's on display at the Field Museum in Chicago. It's a T-Rex that they, you know, they call it Sue, the T-Rex. And Sue sold for several millions of dollars um, at auction. So, you know, and then there is a, a market for fossils. And in some parts of the United States, if you find a dinosaur, you know, on private land in your backyard, you can sell it. If you find it on public land in the United States, then it needs to go to a museum. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's tricky. Yeah, some people look at fossils and you know, they see dollar signs and they want to, to sell them. But of course, I'm a scientist, so, you know, I don't really put price tags on, on fossils. It would be like trying to put a price tag on a, you know, the, the a famous mummy or, you know, a pyramid or something. It's, you know, really hard to do. What a cool answer. Thank you for that, Nizar. And let's go to Anulia for our next question. Anulia, go for it. So my question is, if dinosaurs still existed, how would climate change affect them? That's a good question. I mean, our planet has changed so much. Um, and, you know, so when Spinosaurus was alive, for example, you know, speaking of climate change, when Spinosaurus was alive, our planet was a hothouse planet with very high sea levels. There was no ice on the poles. Um, so it was a, a time of, of extremes, you know, in, in terms of climate. Um, but you know, the, the vegetation would have looked quite different. There's so many things would have been different or to put it another way, if you traveled back in time, 100 million years into the past to the world of Spinosaurus, you would probably feel like you're visiting an alien planet, right? Full of extraterrestrials, it would be really different. So I don't know how well dinosaurs would actually cope with conditions on planet earth today. Um, even animals that lived not that long ago, like woolly mammoths, for example, uh, might have a hard time adapting to, to you know, our planet today. So we don't know, but I suspect that it will be um, pretty challenging. All right, well, our next question comes to us from our YouTube audience. We've got Shay who is wondering, Nizar, what was the first dinosaur that you ever saw? Do you remember that moment? The first I ever saw um, well, I had a book on prehistoric life and I, I, you know, I was really young. I don't know what, you know, which one was the first, you know, dinosaur I saw, but um, it was a book with all the famous dinosaurs. Um, and the first dinosaur skeleton I saw, real dinosaur skeleton, was um, the skeleton of the tallest mounted dinosaur in the world. 
Um, it's uh, on display at the Berlin Natural History Museum in, in, in Germany. It's an animal called Giraffa Titan. It's also known as Brachiosaurus. And um, it's an absolutely amazing skeleton. So you can imagine what it's like when you're like, you know, a young kid and you walk up to this towering skeleton, um, your jaw just drops, right? Because that's when you realize these things really existed, you know? Um, and, 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 you know, of course the size of dinosaurs is one of the really impressive things about them. There are many other things, but yeah. So that was one of the really big early encounters I had with dinosaurs. Awesome. Let's go to Crew for our next question. Crew, go for it. Um, what are, what is your top five favorite fossils? My top five favorite fossils. Oh, that's a really difficult one. I mean, obviously I'm not, I'm a little biased here. <laughs> so Spinosaurus is going to be in my top five just because it's the only Spinosaurus skeleton in the world. And um, it is by far the most complete dinosaur skeleton from this part of the Sahara. Um, I really like the fighting dinosaurs, uh, which is um, two dinosaurs locked in combat, a protoceratops and a velociraptor. That's a pretty cool fossil. Um, Archaeopteryx, um, the first bird, um, or one of the first ones on this lineage, um, is another amazing fossil. It's, uh, you know, it's, it looks like um, a dinosaur skeleton, you know, with a long tail and, and teeth, but then it also has feathers. And then you realize, oh, wow, it's a bird. So it's kind of this mosaic. Of, and it's really pretty as well. If you look it up, um, if you look at the Archaeopteryx um, slab, it's a limestone slab. It's absolutely amazing. So that, that's, that's three. Um, four, I would say is, um, there's some, oh, is this only dinosaurs or other fossils? I can't remember. Why it can be, be expensive. It can be other fossils. It can be other fossils. I, I really like some marine reptile fossils. You know, the ichthyosaurs is kind of vaguely dolphin-like things. And some of them, and in some cases, you can see embryos of little ones. Um, and I would say fifth one, um, I'll pick a pterosaur. There's a really cool pterosaur called Darwinopterus, and it's preserved um, with an egg. So I actually know that this particular individual was a female and the egg was kind of pushed out of the body after the animal died. That's a pretty amazing fossil, kind of snapshot of, of in, in time. So, yep, that's five. <laughs> so cool. We all have a lot of Googling to do now. Um, we've got Liliana online who's wondering how hard it is to find dinosaur bones and Santino who's wondering if there's any good spots that you'd recommend we search. Well, in some parts of the world, it's really quite easy to find dinosaur bones and even dinosaur skeletons, right? So if you go to places like Montana and Wyoming and some parts of Canada, you know, those places have, have um, yielded many, many different skeletons of dinosaurs, some almost complete. Um, the reason why I haven't spent that much time in those parts of the world is that, you know, we know a lot about these North American dinosaurs, as I said earlier. So where we go and dig for dinosaurs in the Sahara, in the Kemkem -Kem region, in, in the border region between Morocco and Algeria, it's really, really, really difficult to find good dinosaur fossils. Um, you find lots of bits and pieces, but finding something like the Spinosaurus skeleton is um, almost impossible. Uh, but then of course you're, you know, it's, it's absolutely amazing when you do find something, right? It's, it's um, you know, but it is really challenging and you have to deal with very difficult uh, conditions, um, extreme heat, and um, you know, all the other challenges I mentioned earlier on. So depends where you go. Uh, if you want to find good fossils, you know, Mongolia is a good place. There's some parts of Argentina that are really good. China is a fantastic place for fossils. Um, and as I said, there are some really great places in the United States, Wyoming, Utah, Montana. Um, so lots of, lots of hot spots. Love that. S. Shaw is wondering if you've ever found any dinosaur bones that could prove that the dinosaur was ill? That's a good question. Well, we sometimes find evidence of broken bones and uh, sometimes we see that these bones healed. Uh, we sometimes even find bite marks. There's one pretty cool uh, skeleton of a plant-eating dinosaur and it has a bite mark of a T-Rex on, on one of its vertebrae. And um, we know that it survived the attack because the bone healed. Um, so we have some evidence for injury for sure. 
Um, you know, th there's some uh, forms of disease of the bone that we find evidence for in dinosaurs. So um, some dinosaurs had pretty painful uh, conditions um, that affected their bones. Um, so yes, we can find some evidence for disease for sure in the same way that we can find evidence for disease in, in humans, uh, skeletons. Awesome. Well, let's take our next question from Gareth. Gareth, your microphone's on, go for it. I've heard that T-Rexes have very short arms. So do you know why they have so short arms? That's a good question. When you look at a T-Rex, you go like, oh my goodness, these arms are ridiculously short, right? Um, and, and, you know, and it's, so some people, it's kind of funny, you know, it's, you can buy these T-shirts saying T-Rex can't do push-ups or something like that. Why does T-Rex hate push-ups, you know? But, but here's the thing. If you're a T-Rex and you look at a human, you might think, ah, oh, humans have pathetically short tails, right? Um, because our tail is extremely short, right? We just have a few tail bones left, they're fused. Um, so humans have a very, very short tail. And the reason why we have a very short tail is that we don't really need it anymore, right? Um, T-Rex, on the other hand, has a long tail that it needs for balance, right? Um, and it just doesn't need the long forelimbs. You know, it's doing all its eating and killing with these massive bone crunching jaws. So, you know, the, the forelimbs just got shorter and shorter um, over the course of, of evolution because these giant predatory dinosaurs didn't really use these forelimbs um, to kill prey and, you know, and to do much else. They'll probably use them in some um, way, shape or form um, because they're still there. They're still pretty powerful, stronger than a human arm, but they're just not that important in the same way that our tail became shorter and shorter um, over the course of human evolution. So that's why T-Rex has short forelimbs. So cool. And Nizar, Dana Morales is wondering what kind of tools you use. Uh, we use different kinds of tools. Um, sometimes we use, uh, you know, chisels and hammers to remove hard rock. On one of our recent expeditions, we even used a jackhammer to remove a um, huge amount of rock. So we had to carry a jackhammer up a mountain, which is, you know, where the Spinosaurus skeleton is. You have to climb up this, this steep escarpment. Um, but then, of course, when, once you get close to the bone bearing layer, you use smaller, finer tools, right? You want to make sure that you don't damage the bones. And once you get to the bones, you know, you sometimes use brushes. Uh, sometimes you try to remove a bone out of the ground. Um, but sometimes you have to wrap the bone in, in, in plaster and then bring it to the lab. And in the lab, we use um, uh, little drills, pneumatic drills and other very fine tools to remove uh, rock from the bones. Uh, and these things look a little bit like dentist tools, right? So we use a wide range of tools to, um, to work on fossils. Awesome. Username Amazing Zach is wondering how many different fossils you've found these are. Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, and it depends how you define fossil. If you mean like every little piece we found, there'll be many, many, many thousands. Um, and, you know, over the last few years, we did collect thousands of fossils. Some of them are just little bits of, you know, turtle shell or a bit of fish skull. Others are really amazing fossils like the um, Spinosaurus skeleton, but um, yeah, many, many thousands. And, and to be honest, every fossil is pretty amazing when you think about it. Even a tiny little piece of, of turtle shell and to think that this little piece survived 100 million years um, and you're the first person to actually look at it is, is pretty amazing. So cool. We've got Garchuleta77, who is wondering if you've ever found a fully intact skeleton that has all of its pieces and how often that kind of thing happens. That essentially um, almost never happens, right? There's always something missing, even the most complete T-Rex skeleton in the world, for example, which is the T-Rex I mentioned earlier on that, that sold at auction, um, is not 100% complete, right? Um, but, you know, when you find several skeletons of the same species, you know, you might have different parts of the skeleton, you can start to get a pretty good idea of what the animal looked like, uh, you can also look at close relatives to, to infer what the missing parts would have looked like. Um, 
but uh, yeah, it's almost impossible to find complete skeletons. I think the only truly complete skeletons we found were some uh, fish fossils we found in marine rocks that are actually on top of the Spinosaurus locality. And those are flattened. And in, you know, you can find some 100% complete skeletons in these layers. Oh, cool. We've got Molly who's wondering if bones can decompose over time. Yeah, and that's what happens to most bones, right? So that's why every fossil find is a small miracle, right? Um, because typically when an animal dies, everything starts to decompose, you know, they're scavengers. Some of the scavengers will actually eat the bones, you know? Um, you also have lots of bacteria and, you know, other tiny organisms that start to decompose um, uh, cadavers. So yeah, the vast majority of, of individuals will never become fossils. And even those that become fossils, only a tiny percentage of those will be excavated and found. Um, and, you know, an even smaller proportion will actually make it to a museum. So the things that you see in a museum are really, you know, tiny little percentage. Brilliant. We've got a bunch of users out there who live really, really far away from museums or research centers and don't have very much access to, to paleontology. Is there anything that you would recommend they do to um, raise awareness or educate themselves or, or get more involved? Yeah, I mean, I think if you live in a place that has amazing fossils but doesn't have a museum, it's certainly worth um, you know, making your voice heard. So in Morocco, we do much of our fieldwork. They don't have a National Museum of Natural History, which is kind of bizarre, right? They have all these amazing fossils. And so we're working very hard to establish a museum there. Um, in terms of um, learning about paleontology and finding out more about, about great museums, you know, of course, now we are in a time when many museums were closed or still are closed, right, um, due to the lockdown. And I found out that you can actually visit many of those museums um, virtually. So you can go and visit the Smithsonian paleontology halls, for example, just using your computer and, and, and internet, right? And so you can see some of the skeletons. Um, so there are some ways to virtually visit these museums, but of course, nothing really compares to the experience of walking into an amazing museum. And so if you're living near a museum, good for you, you're very lucky. If not, um, as I said, it's, it's worth, um, you know, raising awareness of, of your country's or region's ancient heritage and, and try to tell people that you would really love to have a museum in uh, the place you, you know, the region you live in. Amazing. Well, Nizar, do you have any advice for the young explorers who are joining us today? Uh, yes, I mean, one of the things I learned um, in my career as a scientist is that, you know, things are really difficult sometimes. And, you know, <clears throat> now that I found things like spinosaurus and then flying reptiles and what have you, you know, everybody's is telling you, you know, you know, great, well done. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, but in the early stages, it's really tough. When I put together my first expedition in the Sahara, many people actually told me, oh, don't bother. You know, it's, it's too hard to find fossils there. It's really difficult. And so, you know, you face many, many obstacles. And so I think one piece of advice I would like to share with people is, um, you know, you have to, if, if you're really passionate about something, you have to be persistent. You have to be prepared to face obstacles. And you also have to know that some of the people that tell you that you can't achieve a goal don't really know what they're talking about, right? And so I think it's, it's really important to know that, you know, if things are hard and difficult, that's normal. We've all been through this. Um, so, you know, you just have to, to persevere. Brilliant advice. Well, thank you, Nizar. This has been so amazing. I think that we could continue for a million more years and still not make sure. it through all of the, <laughs> the questions on YouTube. Is there anywhere that you would recommend they go to stay, stay up to date with Spinosaurus or learn more about your work? Well, National Geographic is a good place to start, of course. Um, there are several articles and videos you can check out. Um, and as I said, just stay tuned. There um, several other really exciting discoveries from the Sahara we're going to announce um, in the near future. So stay tuned. Will do. 
Well, folks at home, you can check out Explore Classroom and many, many more free educational resources at natgeoed.org. I hope to see you at some of our upcoming events tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern time. We have Rue Samawira, who's going to lead a lesson for young students all about reptiles. And tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern, we're going to learn all about soil which should be a great inspiration to go out and get a little dirty in our backyards after the event. And for now, I want to invite everyone who's up here on screen with me to turn on your microphone. Let's get nice and loud before we sign off and say goodbye and thank you to Nizar. Ready? Bye. Thank you. Thank you.